سلام علیکم Oh, no. 
your spiritual status quo. There's a reason why the Sharia says, eat in small morsels. Because animals eat in large morsels. You're a human. You have to tame your animal dimension. Animals eat in large morsels. Then the Sharia comes and says, it's good to eat it in small morsels. It wants to tame your animal side. It doesn't want you to become animal-like. Eat in small morsels. Eat slowly. Animals eat fast. You see, the underlying rationale of so many rulings, it's so that your animal side is tamed. So that you don't become animalistic. Eat slowly. Eat in groups. Eat together with someone. Don't eat alone. It's better not to eat alone. Animals eat alone. They just get their chunk and they go in a corner and eat it. In Islam, it introduces the Ibrahimi model. Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam where he would travel for travel at long distances to find someone to bring home so he can dine with them. And there are many stories in this regard. He even invites the Mushrikeen to his house and feeds them. One aspect is so that he dines with others. When you dine alone, it precipitates your animal dimension. You just have to look at oneself. When you eat when you're alone, and when you eat in a crowd. When you're alone, it's more likely that the animal side will be precipitated. You eat faster, in larger muscles. That's one aspect. But with the Ibrahimi model, food was a conduit physical food was a conduit to something much more important and that was spiritual food where Nabi Ibrahim salam, would feed the mushrikeen with physical food and at the same time give them spiritual food and in many instances they would convert to Islam to take this in mind when we invite our brothers and sisters to our house it's not for the sake of inviting it's not for the sake of just eating it's for the sake of giving especially spiritual food otherwise you're sufficing with the minimum There was a woman in Iran, she was illiterate, and she had many children, masters, PhD children. And her husband passed away very early. One of the attributes she had was, at lunchtime, when the local garbage man would come, she would always tell the children, invite him in, give him, give him some food. those PhD masters children they thought you know she wasn't feeling well they didn't understand this but she always insisted towards the end of her life she saw Israel one day she saw Israel the angel of death and the angel of death came to take her she said Come tomorrow. And Israel said, okay. And then in that 24 hours, she prepared her funeral procession and ceremony to the smallest detail. And she did her boss, she wore the cafe, and she even went into the coffin, and then she passed away. It was only then her children realized who she was.
before that they thought she was feeling a bit unstable. Do you see these attributes are important? And also what you eat has an effect. That was how one eats. But also what you eat has an effect on your spirituality. In addition to what you eat, with which animals you live with can also have an effect on your spirituality. Why do you think the meat of pigs and dogs are haram in Islam? It's not a case of there just being certain bacteria. Some scientists keep on trying to find physical answers to spiritual questions. It's not like that, although their endeavors are noble. But it's not a case of a pig or a dog having certain bacteria that other animals don't have. That's not why Islam made it haram. And years later they find the same bacteria in other animals which are permissible to consume. It's problematic going down this route. You can't understand the spiritual intricacies of Islam through the phys physical dimension of science at least. It's much more deeper than that. The meat of pigs are haram because if you consume it, you acquire pig attributes. You become a pig, not your phenotype. But you will have pig attributes. You consume the meat of dogs, you will acquire dog attributes. Islam wants to make you a human, not just phenotypically, a real human that can surpass angels. These are impediments. Why do you think predators are haram in Islam? Because you'll be a predator. Even animals that have predator instincts, oh, they're not predators, but they have certain predator characteristics. They're haram, like the rabbit. And you may think that this is going overboard a bit. However, just think about it rationally. Why do we tell our children, be you Muslim or non-Muslim, why do you tell your child not to have bad friends? Why do you tell them, don't have bad friends, have a good friend? A good friend makes you righteous. A bad friend makes you vicious. Why? We don't want them to have bad friends because they'll become bad. What is it that makes them bad? Just accompanying a bad person enables that transition of negative characteristics even though there's no touch, no touch has been made. But negative characteristics transcend to the other person. This rationality accepts, we all see it. We easily become influenced. A bad person makes you bad. Some people sooner, some people later. But it's difficult to preserve oneself. Now just think when you eat an animal, like a dog or a pig. Those pig attributes, those dog attributes, those predator attributes, they cross over. And then you become pig-like, dog-like, predator-like. Islam doesn't want that. And then some meats of animals are permissible to consume, like cattle, sheep, cows. But even then, it's within limits. The reason we can consume the meat of sheep and cows is because they're benign animals. 
They don't have any dangerous qualities, like the pig, who has certain characteristics, such as greed and other things, like the dog. No, the cow and the sheep, they're benign. They don't have any dangerous attributes. However, if you overdo it, even with the meat of sheep and cows, if you overdo it, you acquire the attributes of sheep and cows. What are they? You become sloppy. You become very lazy. I'll do this later. No. The way that meat has been introduced in our diet today, especially in the West, but also in the East, it's not the Islamic objective. Islam isn't wholly vegetarian, no. But it does have a vegetarian dimension. Meat once a day, once every two days, once every three days. And if you want to have meat for lunch and for dinner, very little. Don't overdo it. You require these attributes. In some countries, they consume insects. Who? They boil them and they consume the insects. They acquire those insect attributes. I didn't want to go into detail with what that means. But if you look carefully and observe it, they acquire attributes of those insects that they eat. It's like in Islam, it's Hanon, all forms of insects eating them. And then the question arises as to having pets. When you can't buy a dog or a pig, well, unless the dog is taught security, it's a security dog, it's taught to be a security dog. Otherwise, you can't purchase dogs or pigs. Just in case someone has purchased one already, don't worry, don't panic. Nothing, nothing's going to happen. However, what about cats and other animals that one purchases? Yes, they're allowed, you can purchase a cat. You can purchase a hamster, for example, and other animals. The question is, you shouldn't, but with the cat, the question in relation to its hairs, since it's the hair of a haram meat animal, it shouldn't accompany you when you're doing your salat. The right to Nasistani accepts it for those who follow it, but I don't want to enter a filthy discussion here. The point is this, yes, you can have these pets. But don't acquire and, and, and show compassion to animals, even to the dog and the pig. Islam is all for compassion to animals. Don't show violence or hostile behavior to animals. However, don't acquire an affinity to your pets, like the cat. Be careful. If you acquire an affinity Towards the cat, you acquire cat attributes. It's okay if you have a cat, there's no problem. But you shouldn't acquire an, an affinity too much with it. It's like that good friend and bad friend. Otherwise, you'll acquire attributes of the cat. And then you become cat-like. And that's not good. The same with hamsters and pets. You're a researcher, and your research is on such animals, and you acquire affinity towards it. These things have been seen and observed. There's a story, I'm not sure if it's a true story or not, but it's on a, it's on a par with Erfani principles. There was a king whose daughter wouldn't marry and he would get the best doctors to see if she has a problem. So they went one by one and they couldn't find the reason why she wouldn't want to marry. She kept on refraining. 
And then a Hakim came, a wise man. And then he said, show me where the daughter lives. He went there, and in the place where the daughter lived, there were many cats. The wise man understood what has gone wrong here. So he went to the king and said, remove all the cats and replace them with pigeons and the problem will be solved. And the story ends there. The moral of the story is this. And this is how the scholars have interpreted it. Cats have very, forgive me for using this expression, they have very vicious or violent mating practices. It's very violent. And she would see this. And then she was scared of marrying because of what she saw. Pigeons, on the other hand, are very gentle in their mating practices. So they replaced it with pigeons, and then after a period of time, she married. You see, the effect it had. In the West, you, we're seeing in the West today that many people, single men and women, are living with cats or dogs. And they acquire a very serious affinity towards them. And this is going to cause problems in their married life. And one has to take this in mind. Another issue is in relation to when we eat. When we shouldn't be at that stage that we eat whenever we want. For example, coffee or snacks is something that many of us, we keep on, whenever we feel like it, feel like it we just want to take a coffee, for example. There's no disciplining of when we are eating. And that's a characteristic of animals too. They eat whenever they want. They're not disciplining the soul. You have to discipline your hours of eating. If you want to have two meals a day or three meals a day, but at set times, in between, you don't eat. You discipline the soul. Don't let the soul run loose. If the soul runs loose, then in other domains of life it will run loose too. You have to discipline it. For example, one o'clock is time for lunch. Not earlier, not later. And try to avoid all these snacks in between. This is also animalistic. You're a human. I don't want to go too much into details, just two other examples I want to give. They're not in relation to food, but they're two important aspects which have entered our lives today and maybe loosening our souls without us understanding it. One is the mobile phone. And no one is saying the mobile phone is bad. Of course not. But this mobile phone also has to be controlled. You don't answer 24 hours a day whenever it rings. You don't answer it. There's some hours you have with the family. If the mobile rings, you don't answer. Family hours shouldn't be compromised. You have to discipline your use of the mobile phone. Just because someone has sms you, you don't run towards every SMS that rings. Don't let it control you. It can lead to many spiritual illnesses. 
One of them is obsession. This very slowly creeps in one's life. One of the ways of preventing obsession, because once you, you enter Vaswas, you can't come out. It comes too late. But preventing Vaswas, one of the roots is that of disciplining the soul. How you use your mobile, be careful. You're a human. You discipline yourself. You're not controlled by that gadget. If it rings, it rings. There's certain hours I'm doing a bad art. I'm with the family. I'm speaking with someone. I'm at a meeting. It's night time. Why should someone bother you at night? That means some people, their work is with the mobile. There are exceptions, don't worry, yes. Another is driving. I'm sorry I'm mentioning these kind of things, but I'm seeing so many negative things when I drive with people and that I've just come here to Phoenix. But in general, I'm saying everywhere I go, this is a problem. People don't know how to drive. Driving, you can tell someone's character through their driving. Then some people drive and text. And when I'm sitting on the passenger seat and someone is driving and texting, or driving and speaking on the phone, then one hand is on the phone, the other hand is on the wheel, and then he changes gear with one hand, does the indicator with one hand. I say to myself that even if the cow, even if he was taking a flock of sheep to a certain destination, he would drive just the same. It doesn't matter if I'm in the passenger seat or a cow is on the passenger seat. What's the problem there? <clears throat> the problem is that people have no respect for human life. When you treat human life like that, you're going to have a wife one day. You're going to have children one day. Look how you're going to treat them. And when you drive, you drive slowly. You observe the etiquette. These are very basic things, but basic things that we're failing. And all this will have a negative effect on our soul. Okay. Now, as a preface to tonight's ceremony of Laylatul Qadr and also the martyrdom of Amirul Mu'mineen. One of the formulae that is recommended to read tonight is Allahumma al-an qatalata amir al-mu'minin O Allah, curse the killers of amir al-mu'minin No names are mentioned, just the killers of amir al-mu'minin and with your permission, I want to say a few words on what cursing means and the inner dimensions of cursing. Because cursing or la'an in Arabic, la'an, has a superficial meaning, but it has deeper meanings too. If you suffice with the superficial meaning, that's not the goal. And actually, if you suffice with the superficial meaning, it can precipitate negative emotions within you, distancing you from your spiritual potential. Lan means being distanced. 
being distanced. So let's say a child is ill and they shouldn't consume honey for whatever reason. The mother says to the child, Il'an, Il'an, be distanced. For the best, for the best interests of the child, she says, be distanced from the honey. Don't consume this honey, be distanced from it. You're ill. This is going to be bad for you if you consume it. That's the literal meaning of lamb. And in the technical sense, in the superficial technical sense of the term, it means being distanced when you curse someone. It says be distanced from Allah's mercy. And when you say be distanced from Allah's mercy, in effect you mean you hope that they die a physical death. Because when Allah's mercy is cut from you, one dies a physical death. One will persist in the immaterial realms of existence. But a physical death will be cut off. And that's the superficial meaning of it. There's a similarity between la'an and the hudud, the penalties that are sentenced for criminals. There's a similar rationale here. When certain crimes, because of their passing a certain threshold, here the Sharia says that the death penalty is their due. And usually, the threshold involves polluting the public. When people do certain things, like adultery and other sins, in the public, they are polluting and killing the souls of the people in public. And in an Islamic state where people want Islam, where the Sharia is the guardian of the faith, if someone does that, comes intentionally and kills the spirit in society of people with certain sins, the death penalty is given. And this is nothing to be ashamed of. The killing of the spirit is much worse than killing of the physical body. If only we knew, but we're blind. However, when we execute these penalties, the underlying rationale is this, that we feel sorry for this man who has committed such a crime. He's passed the threshold since he's passed that, passed that threshold, the Sharia says, get rid of him, otherwise he'll just pollute himself more and more. You see? The Sharia is feeling for this person. The Sharia wants the person to sin less. And says, yes, now death penalty is sentenced. So this death penalty is based on love. But if the death penalty is executed and then certain people jump in joy, they've lost the plot. The reason you're taking that person's life is out of love. What kind of love? This person, all the chances are, will just continue with this sinning and blackening himself, free him from this world. He didn't know his best interests were. Free him. And with that, he'll go to the hereafter and he's already been punished for what he did there. And the chances are much better. I'm saying the underlying rationale is for the best interest of that person. In cursing too, if you feel that that person, because of their actions, is substantiated before you, then there's no way he will return from doing bad actions. This person does so much bad 
that they won't return to doing good. You don't deem it probable. Here we can curse people. But the reason why we curse them is that this person won't return to good ways anymore. We feel sorry for him. We don't want him to continue blackening his spirit. Let him go and be distanced from Allah's mercy. Because it has to be based on that love. If it's not based on love, that sentencing in the court and this cursing will just precipitate hostility which can end in very dangerous dangerous Salafi Wahhabi type behavior. You have to be careful. It's all based on love. You take the love away, it's going to be a very animalistic, vicious, hostile picture you have, both of Latin and of sentencing. Okay. The next point is, okay, that's Islam's take in relation to criminals in this world, evil people, sinners. And it's all about love. al hubbu asasi, the Holy Messenger said. Love is my first course of action. It's all based on that. That's for people in this world. But what about when you curse those who have passed away? The people who have passed away now. Why do you curse them? See, this also has to be answered. You have to know why we're cursing. If we never teach the community why we're cursing, it's going to lead to difficulties. It's going to lead to difficulties. And a far less community is like a lifeless corpse. Oytullah Hassan Zawda has said. It's a lifeless corpse. You have to teach the Sharia with its inner meanings. And you have to do it to the children at a young age. Many of these Salafi Wahhabi movements, it's because they have sufficed with the letter of the law. And they've rejected all butun, all inner dimensions of Islam. So why do we curse those who have passed away? Well, one superficial reason is educational. That just to curse those people who have passed away who did bad actions, Edu it's for education, it's an educational tool so that if we see those attributes of those who are, we are cursing in society today, we know who to curse today. Like the Obamas, the Netanyahu's, and so on and so forth. There's no doubt about it. I'm not saying America is bad, but the government is definitely to be cursed. There's no doubt about it. The government is wide. I'm not even saying every department, but certain departments, they need to be cursed. And assisting with those departments and confirming their actions is haram in Islam. Now what does it mean to assist or confirm their actions? That no one can tell you. That's for you to ascertain. Not me as a scholar. I'm just giving you the general principle. You can't assist certain departments of the American government. You can't assist them. You can't be labeled, oh, he's someone who is helping in that department, with the workings of that department. And if you are working in that department, just resign, no problem. They won't do anything to you. And you just come out 
Alhamdulillah, there's a lot of opportunity in this country. Find another job. The opportunity you have here is much more than many countries in the world. It's not as if you're stuck in that job. The general criterion is that. Now, whether you fit or not, don't listen to anyone else. You know if you're labeled as one who assists and confirms, accepts, approves the actions of certain departments of this government. Anyway, these are models. If we see someone more all we like, we curse. It doesn't have to be in the West either, it may be in the East, and so on and so forth. But that was a superficial reason why we curse those who have already passed away. However, more importantly, this is the reason why. Because even in relation, and you just have to pay attention a bit, it gets a bit tricky. But it's easy, but just, if you just pay attention here. Even in relation to those who have passed away, when you're cursing them, you're saying, be distanced away from Allah's mercy. Now here, we have two forms of mercy. Ar-Rahmani mercy, which is that universal mercy of Allah given to Muslims, given to non-Muslims, given to animals, like the rain, life, and so on and so forth. Then there's another mercy, a Rahimi mercy. It's a specifically, a specific mercy given by Allah to those who deserve it. And it can be given here. In the hereafter, it's usually heaven and heavenly things. It's a Rahimi mercy. When you say, in relation to those who have passed away, criminals who have passed away, vicious people who have passed away, people whose viciousness has been substantiated before you. Okay? Otherwise, cursing has no place. You say, oh Allah, distance them from your mercy. Okay? You distance them from your Rahimi mercy. Here, Il'an and La'an and the hereafter, is distancing from Allah's mercy, but not the Rahmani type. The person still exists. There's no physical body, but the person still exists, and the person will be eternal. The Rahmani mercy is still there. Distancing from Rahimi mercy. Distance him from going into heaven. Let him burn in hell more. Now when someone burns in hell, sometimes after a period of time, although time has no meaning there, after one's impurities have been burnt, and you are your actions, hell is a function of your actions, there's no one outside you burning you or whipping you. Your actions of the soul are manifesting. It's part of who you are. You are your actions. You are the director of your hell. I've spoken about this before. I don't want to repeat all this. When the person is burning, after a period of time, if they had faith, but were overloaded with sins, some people have faith, but they were predominated with sins. After a period, they go to heaven. So when you curse certain people, is you're saying let them be burnt more, and then after being burnt, that necessary burning, where one's inner impurities are all effaced, one goes to heaven. That's one meaning of cursing. It's also based on love. But there are some people who are always in hell. Now, contrary.
contrary to what the theologians believe, the Orafor don't accept that the torment and chastisement of hell is eternal. Yes, some people will always be in hell, but it doesn't mean they will always be burning. After a period of time, these people will get used to the scorpions and the fire. They will never go to heaven. When you're cursing even such people, these people are always in hell. The shivers. These people, when you're cursing, you say, Oh Allah, make them distance from your Rahim mercy. Let them always be in hell. That's your prayer. And then they will always be in hell. Not that they will be burning. Yes, there'll be a long time of burning. But eventually hell, according to traditions, they'll be playing with the fire. That's their home. These people can't go to heaven. If you take them to heaven, it's going to be more punishing for them. They give this example usually. Forgive me for the example, but... For example, let's say you want to go to the lavatory and you're very desperate. It's number two, for example. You're very desperate. It's on the brink of explosion. Someone comes and offers you one of two things. One room is a black, dirty pit. Very with a very rotten smell. That's one room that you can go into. The other room is a very luxurious, chic restaurant, but it has no toilet. But it has the best of foods. This person, who's very desperate now, and that desperation arising as a result of one's own actions, which room will they pick? They'll pick that black, dirty hole. Because they're on a par with that. You take them to the nice, clean restaurant, that's torture. When you take into consideration the state of their affairs. They want to go to the pit and relieve themselves. You put them into the head, to the restaurant, you're torturing them. So, when we send the lack, especially in relation to the Qatalata Amir al Mu'mineen, it's this that we want that Rahimi mercy to be cut from them for what they did to Amir al Mu'mineen. They will always be in hell. It's a prayer, it's a dua. In the same way that you do a dua for someone to go to a high place in heaven. What effect will your door have? To what extent will your door have an effect? This is la and is also a form of door. Cutting them from that Rahimi mercy. But having this in mind, if this wasn't cut, they were to go to hell, it's torturous for them. Let them be in that hell forever. And if you like, you can even say that hell is there in quotes heaven after a period of time. Not in the beginning, it's going to be very torturous, tormentful, chastising. Okay, with your permission, I'll stop there and recite a few words of Musiba, inshallah, with your permission.